Last week, at the news of Pastor's mother, Chris reached out to Pete and I, asking if either of us were interested, called, or, or moved to preach this week. He also added that it was a particularly tough text. It was something out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. Chris was not all that far from the truth with this statement. Today's gospel is remissive of Quentin's work. And for those of you who may not know who Mr. Tarantino is, he's a well-known actor, producer, screenwriter, and director in Hollywood. Some of his most famous works are Kill Bill, Reservoir Dogs, and Pulp Fiction. And Quentin's known for his famous traits of, especially in these movies, excessive use of force, blood, and violence, with many of his plots revolving around vengeance, redemption, and revenge. They not only give his viewers the pleasure of allowing the protagonist to settle the score and right wrongs, but in most cases, his characters either need saving or are the ones doing the saving. So if we're to make today's gospel into a movie and un unpack the script, who are the characters relevant to today's time? Who is the landowner, the tenants? Who are the servants of the landowner? And who are the priests and the Pharisees? Today's gospel is kind of angry, gory, has a mean vibe about it, right? I mean, the landowner sends his servants to collect the harvest and the tenants kill them. They stone them and they beat them. He sends yet more service, being persistent. Probably has bills to pay. He needs the crops, needs the money. And they're treated just the same, beat, stoned, and killed. Fed up with their nonsense, he sends his son. And the tennis, once again, in all their illustrious glory, their greed and their selfishness, they kill the son and cast him aside like roadkill. <clears throat> Matthew was a tax collector. He's one of the first 12 telling us this story. And it's his account, this recollection, it's this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees and the chief priests. And this interaction, it takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. It's happening not long before Jesus is actually tried and put to death. And this confrontation between the high ranking biblical scholars and Jesus is his own response to their leadership. It is a call in his father's kingdom. A call on what the Pharisees and the priests are to do. And a reminder of what you and I are called to do. And all the blood and the glory here, I think the parable really starts warming up at verse 40. This is where Jesus starts getting into the meat, right? <clears throat> Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, he asks the question, what will he do to those tenants? And you think, you think about that. He's asking the scholars, he's asking them, what are you gonna do? What would, what would the landowner do? He's smart, he's clever, he knows his audience, and he's, he's baiting them. And they don't even see it coming because they respond with, off with his head. The landowner is going to give these wretches a wretched end. He will repay evil with evil. And then he will find somebody to replace him. He'll find somebody else to care for his land and tend to his crops. Jesus is like, 
No, goofballs. You got it all wrong. Haven't you read scriptures? The stone the builders reject, the stone the builders rejected, will become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous. Now, the relevance of the capstone in Matthew's time is when buildings at that time were built with stone and bricks and rock. They were built with the things that they had, and they didn't form them. They used what they had. They didn't have the likes of concrete that they could form to whatever shape they imagined and let it set up. They used what they had. So the capstone, the cornerstone, was the most important piece in a building. The first stone that was replaced or placed that every other stone, every other piece of the building relied on for support. Much like a keystone as well. It is the last piece that is placed that holds the arch together. A keystone then and today and in this parable in our lives is Christ. Jesus goes on to say, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you, Pharisees and priests, and will give to those who will produce fruit. He who falls on that rejected stone, that capstone, will be broken to bits, and he on whom it falls will be crushed. And it was at that point I scholars realized Right? They look, they start scheming, looking for ways to plot and kill and arrest Jesus because they are threatened and they know that Jesus is calling them out and talking about them. And in this violent screenwriter's dream of a gospel, it's not Matthew and Jesus who are the violent ones, but the Pharisees and the priests It is the scholars who want to repay evil with evil. The most educated biblical people of the time say, bring those wretches to a wretched end. Jesus is merely telling them what will happen if they do not change their ways, right? Unlike Quentin's movies, repaying evil with evil, where a tortured victim repays his accusers with vengeance, Jesus has a much harder task for us. In this Quentin-esque gospel of a movie, I, I ask, what is your role? Because I think Jesus does a great job of foreshadowing in today's gospel. We can liken the landowner to God. The servants are representative of God's faithful people. The landowner's son being Jesus. And the tenants being evil. The devil. Agents of the dark forces in our world and in our own hearts and in those of us who have succumbed to those forces. The Pharisees and the priests are those who think they are entitled or better than the rest of us. Because we all have been rejected in some way or another. And I assure you, we all have been given the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not only asking us, but he's challenging us. He's challenging us not to fight evil with evil, but to fight evil with love and sacrifice. And what Jesus is asking us to do is hard. It's harder to do. Because he's asking us to sacrifice of ourselves, our hate, our greed, our need for vengeance, our envy, our will to be right. And these things can come in many forms, whether it's a squabble over toilet paper in the midst of a pandemic, Maybe your spouse said something that hurt your feelings. 
you might resent your boss because he has a second house on the lake. Or possibly you think all cops should pay for a few's mistake. Whatever it is, Jesus is giving us insight into what God thinks. He's given us that insight so we will be more like him. God is inviting us to action, and he's doing so through Jesus. God's truth, if taken seriously, will not just transform our minds and hearts, but also our behavior. It will become actions, excuse me, it will become action points for our obedience. You know, our brother Pete says that all Hollywood movies start here in the gospel and in the scripture. And I think he's pretty spot on because Quentin Tarantino has nothing compared to Matthew. If you ask me, Matthew gets the Oscar at this year's Academy Awards. You all are capstones and keystones in this kingdom, in God's kingdom. Go forth like the rocks you are in the faith that God has given you. Amen. I don't know if I'm a rock or wild grapes or <laughs> still trying to figure that out. Hopefully I'm one of the landowner servants. Please join me with the prayers of the people. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and for all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those who, whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables for all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation, especially Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride and let us take advantage that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruit of the kingdom for the good and the welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life, assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in our loving arms all for whom we pray. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. Mother and God, Father and Son, 
Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Um, I did share with Chris that I would uh, want to do a temple talk today. I don't know if that translated out, but that's okay. We're good. We're good. Nope. So um, my name is Susie, and I'm a family member here at the Lutheran Church of Muhammad. Yes, please have a seat. <laughs> that means you too, Brian. Um, one of my guilty pleasures is uh, at work, I often eat at my desk and uh, read the news on my computer and early um, on in August, I was reading a, a story which really broke my heart. And I wanna share that story with you. Um, this is from the Lutheran um, World Relief Organization. So I'm reading it in their person. And it says, the city of Beirut, Lebanon is in crisis. The August 4th explosion took many lives and flattened an entire portion of the city. Thousands of our neighbors are injured 300,000 are homeless and hospitals are so overwhelmed that they are turning people away. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting Lebanon hard. Our team works around the clock to organize Lutheran World's Relief's humanitarian response. We give thanks that all of our staff and our partners in Beirut survived the blast. Though some are recovering from injuries and the loss of their homes, we are thankful Still, we cry out, asking why such a tragedy would happen in a time and place fraught with so many other trials. Unfortunately, this disaster created a setback to our programs. The blast destroyed three of our 40-foot shipping containers, which were stored in the port and held more than 22,000 Lutheran World Relief mission quilts, 100 cartons of school kits, 300 cartons of personal care kits, 125 cartons of baby care kits that were being prepared for distribution. Now an estimated 24,000 people, men, women, and children who were already in great need will not receive these essential supplies. The monetary value of this loss is more than $623,000. Yet the value of the time and love our quilters and quilt makers put into sewing and assembling and praying over these items is impossible to calculate. Though this loss is small compared to any loss of life, we are devastated that our neighbors who are already struggling and who need these items now more than ever will suffer even more without them. This loss could mean a bitter winter for thousands of refugees. Our quilts are made with, the love, by, with love by those who painstakingly craft them and they're deeply appreciated by the people in distress who receive them for both the warmth and the message of pay of care they provide. So that saddened me um, to read that when I look at um, our own church and the work that the ladies do to make the quilts here. And when we were getting ready to open the sanctuary, um, the quilting ladies allowed us to use their quilts to um, socially distance ourselves and yet allow our sanctuary to be as beautiful it is with these handmade items. So we're very grateful for that. And I shared with Fran that morning, it was a Saturday morning that the quilts had been lost in Beirut and she shared my sadness with me. Well, fast forward to this week, one of my other, again, back to my guilty pleasures, um, there was a newsletter from the local Senate office and it, I skimmed through the newsletter but got to this um, portion where it said this. Some good news from Beirut, three 40 foot shipping containers filled with thousands of mission quilts and school personal and baby care kits which report, were reported as destroyed in the August 4th explosion at the port of Beirut have been found intact. It took several weeks for the Lutheran World Relief's partner to gain access to the port area where the containers were stored. While some of our partners, partners shipping containers were heavily damaged, it appears that the three containers containing the quilts and kits were stored behind a concrete block building, a spot protected from the blast. The, quilt, the quilts and kits have been transferred to a warehouse from where they will be distributed to refugees living in Lebanon, principally from Syria and the Palestinian territories. In addition to distributing the kits, the Lutheran World Relief is also working to address immense shelter needs in the wake of the explosion, helping poorer families to repair and return to their homes. 
So what joy I felt um, when I read that this week at work and um, what a God moment that was for me uh, to know that and in the midst of tragedy, um, there was some uh, a, this blessing of finding these um, kits that uh, so many across the, our world make and send to these refugees um, everywhere. And it was just um, a moment when I read that those that those containers were behind a concrete uh, building block it was amazing to me. And I thought it was um, appropriate to share with you that uh, God's work is always at hand and always with us. Um, in addition to that, I talked with Fran and uh, asked her what, what they're up to and what their needs might be. And she specifically shared with me um, what each kid is made of and how they um, gather these items. I'm just gonna quickly go over this. And then I'm gonna put this on the bulletin board in the narthex so that people can see what uh, is gathered by our ladies and made into these kits. Uh, they are layettes, they are the baby care kits. They consist of two baby blankets two sleepers, two shirts, one hand towel, one jacket or sweater with a hood or a separate hat, two pairs of socks, four cloth diapers, two bars of mild soap, two large safety pins and sizes up to 24 months. Um, Fran did share with me that the baby receiving blankets are in need right now. They are having a hard time finding some of these things. They go to garage sales and gather these things for the kits. Um, personal care kits consist of one large towel, one wide tooth comb, one individually packaged toothbrush, one fingernail clipper, and two bars of mild soap. The school bags um, contain one draw, uh, drawstring style backpack, four 70 page spiral notebooks, one box of 24 cray crayons, one 12 inch ruler with 30 centimeters, one big pink eraser, one pair of blunt scissors, one handheld pencil sharpener, six unsharpened number two wooden pencils, and six black or blue ballpoint pens. The quilts, um, they our ladies use a flat bed sheet for the back. They're pieced together with not so perfect fabric filler in the middle. And an attractive piece of fabric is placed on top and we can all look around and see that work and what it looks like. These items are pinned together around the edges, tied with colorful yarn throughout the, throughout the flat surface and sewn together around the edges. The finished quilts are 60 by 80 inches in size. All of these items are packed in cardboard block boxes, labeled and taped together shut. Each bat box has only one kind of an item in it. Last year in 2019, the Lutheran Church of Muhammad shipped 251 quilts, 163 personal care kits, 191 school kits, and 88 baby care kits in a total of 94 boxes on Friday, October 25th. This year's shipping date will be Friday, October 30th. And Fran notes that they could always uh, need flat sheets and fitted sheets for the backing. So when you think about how many um, quilts, personal care kits, school kits, baby kits that came out of this church in a single year that get sent overseas to be distributed to people in need. And to think that our quilts along with everybody else's quilts were once thought lost, but have been found and to be given back out to those in need is truly a God moment for, for all of us. And it's the work of um, God's hands that make those things happen. So um, anyone who might be interested in knowing what the kit needs are, I'm gonna put it um, in the back. Fran, is there anything you wanna add at all? So you work on Monday mornings, right? And at what time do you get started? Nine o'clock. That's wonderful. So I hope to retire soon. And I've been telling Fran for years, and it's the truth. It's the first thing I'm going to do is join the uh, quilting group. I can't wait to do that. So thank you, Fran. Thank you and your, your group. That's all I have for you this morning. I appreciate you taking the extra few minutes to listen to me and have a wonderful day, everyone. And let um, God be with you, each and every one of you all week long and every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, one last reminder, I forgot the announcements this morning. Um, congregational meeting coming up on October the 11th, I think is the date, right? So just a reminder for the meeting. So go in peace.